Well, thank you all for coming, turning out in the snow and the rain and the wind that it took to get here from where your hotels or Airbnbs or wherever you're staying. Um, I'm Ann Holler. I have the lofty title of uh, chief scientist at a small company called Alodal, and I appreciate the chance to talk with you today about SkyRay, which is seamlessly extending CubeRay to multi-cluster, multi-cloud operation. So first, a show of hands, how many people use, have used Ray? So a fair number. How about CubeRay? I assume if you're here at the conference and you're using Ray, you've used CubeRay. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so for those who are less familiar with Ray, it's a unified framework that can scale AI ML applications from running on a laptop to running in a cluster. And CubeRay allows the deletion, creation, and scaling of Ray clusters, Ray jobs, and Ray services um, on a Kubernetes cluster. So kind of the diagram here of what the CubeRay structure is, is you've got your Kubernetes cluster on the bottom, either from your cloud or self-hosted, and you're running CubeRay on top of it to be able to run your Ray clusters. But what if you have more than one cluster? So how many of you regularly use multiple Kubernetes clusters? Okay, pr pretty much most everybody. And then how about multiple clouds? Okay. so. You know, there's a lot of reasons you're using multiple Kubernetes clusters. You want to group the resources by characteristics. You want service continuity, so you want clusters in different regions, so if one region goes down, you don't lose your infrastructure. You might have clusters for different purposes. You have a production cluster that you're tightly monitoring, that you're watching out for particular resources that you've vetted as being appropriate for production work, and you've got your development cluster with a, a lower QoS, uh, maybe it's dynamic and so on. So you've got that kind of reason. You have resource availability. You have a cluster in this region because GPUs are available there. You have a cluster in this region because it's cheaper. And of course, there's a lot of reasons to use uh, multiple cloud vendors. You want to avoid cloud vendor lock-in. You want to meet your customers where they are. Maybe they have a preference for a certain cloud vendor. Um, so the sort of thinking about um, multiple clusters and multiple clouds brings in the idea of sky computing, which was described in a recent uh, paper from Berkeley, talking about what's needed to make sky computing happen. And one of the key things is a commodity cloud compute layer. Now, you could argue that Kubernetes is a commodity cloud compute layer. But for that to really be credible, it needs to be almost as easy to use multiple clusters as it is to use one cluster. Um, so that's the idea around SkyRay. SkyRay is trying to skyify CubeRay. So it's trying to extend CubeRay's operation from a single cluster environment to a multi-cluster, multi-cloud operation. And so this is achieved by having um, it work with a policy-driven uh, Kubernetes fleet manager. So the fleet manager presents a Kubernetes API to the user, and it interoperates with CubeRay. The fleet manager deploys CubeRay on each cluster in a workload set uh, using a, a fleet manager policy to do so, spread duplicate. Then the fleet manager places CubeRay uh, clusters, jobs, and services that arrive from users onto particular workload clusters depending on policies and depending on what it knows about that workload cluster. And then CubeRay on that workload cluster deals with the things that are placed there just like it would normally. Um, and so there's a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes fleet managers available, including Karmata, Open Cluster Management, and Nova are some examples. So that's the vision of SkyRay. Let's look how it operates in more detail. So basically, CubeRay supports three custom resource definitions. The Ray cluster, which lets you create a cluster with specified resources and attributes. The Ray job, which creates a Ray cluster and then submits a job to that cluster when it's ready, and then can optionally delete that cluster when you no longer need it. This is often used for MLAI training. And the Ray service, which creates the cluster, runs a Ray serve deployment graph on that cluster. Ray services have a bunch of features. The most notable for this talk is uh, Ray service auto scaling, which involves the idea that if the service has a bunch of uh, requests queuing up, it needs more resources, and so it automatically scales up its request to CubeRay for more resources. Any of these CubeRay deployments, speaking of autoscaling, can run with the Ray autoscaler, which when it sees that the Ray job or service or cluster needs more resources, it automatically re requests them from the Kubernetes cluster. 
So based on how Cube Ray works, this is how Sky Ray works in more detail. The fleet manager is watching all of its workload clusters that it's managing. It's looking at, it knows their name, it knows the cloud provider they come from, it knows the region they're in, it knows the available capacity they have, it knows labels that the operators put on them, it knows the Kubernetes version they're running, it knows whether or not they're running a cluster autoscaler, et cetera. So the fleet manager schedules Kubray and its CRDs, those three CRDs we just talked about, on all the workload clusters, according to a fleet manager policy that says spread duplicate. And then when jobs, clusters, or service requests come in, the fleet manager schedules them on the workload cluster, and then, as we said, Kubray handles it from there. Um, there's, as I said, many fleet managers available. For our work, we used the ANOVA fleet manager. It includes several relevant capabilities that made it a good choice for this work. It supports the spread duplicate policy, which we already talked about. It, spreads, it supports the uh, specified cluster policy and the priority policy, which we'll talk about during the course of the, of the uh, talk. And in particular, it supports an available capacity policy. So this policy says, don't place this set of jobs unless you can place them all together at, uh, at once. So it's basically a gang scheduling policy. And so ML AI training jobs uh, often require gang scheduling because there's a distributed training process that needs the workers to make progress in a coordinated fashion. And in addition, NOVA recognizes Ray cluster CRDs and understands them. It understands what the worker and head requests for resources are, so it's able to understand whether there's available capacity for the Ray items. Um, another feature that's interesting from the standpoint of SkyRay is the NOVA just-in-time clusters feature. What that means is if a cluster becomes idle, NOVA will uh, basically uh, scale it to zero or delete it, depending on which option you prefer. And then when it becomes busy again, when it's needed again, it will reconstitute it. The, in addition, NOVA is autoscaler aware. That means it understands whether the cluster, the workload cluster, is running a cluster autoscaler. It currently recognizes the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler and the Luna cluster autoscaler. And so if multiple clusters satisfy a workload placement policy, NOVA tries to place the workload on a cluster that already has the resources available. But if there is no such cluster right now, it then chooses a target cluster that's running a cluster autoscaler with the idea that that cluster autoscaler can obtain the resources. So for our Skyway work, we use the Luna Smart Cluster Autoscaler. You see a little diagram at the bottom of the screen about how a cluster uh, autoscaler works with Luna. It looks at pending pods. It can place them together if they're small so they can share a node, or it can uh, allocate custom size uh, nodes for them if they're larger. And since MLAI workloads often require expensive GPU resources for certain uh, scenarios, it can be nice to have a cluster autoscaler running to scale those resources up and down. So now let's look at a, some examples of how SkyRay can be used to achieve uh, certain policy objectives. Um, so to, to recap, we'll have the Nova control plane running. It will take policies that um, the operator wants to apply to workloads. It will use those policies to schedule CubeRay and its CRDs, and it will also use policies to schedule the Ray service, Ray job, and Ray cluster custom resources. So all the scripts and Kubernetes YAMLs and so on that are used for these examples are available in this open source repo. You'll see that some of the examples will include dynamic allocation. Uh, one of them will include compound AI. So these are the six example use cases we'll look at. Uh, two of them are training, four of them are serving. Um, I tried to get a mix of things that I thought customers often do along with a mix of things that are, show what's possible if you were really interested in pushing the envelope. And I, I hope some of these match scenarios you have, but even if they don't, these, the, the, the infrastructure is flexible, you can craft policies that will match uh, your needs. Um, for the simplicity of presentation, all the scenario examples only involve two clusters. Um, and so after the cube ray um, has been deployed, uh, you see this is what it looks like from the Nova control plane standpoint. It has two cube ray operators, one working in each of the two uh, workload clusters. Um, and all these uh, examples use the environment variable uh, SkyRay path to point at that open source 
repo that I talked about. Okay, so the first example is that you want to place a series of production training jobs. These jobs have proven their worth in terms of business value, and so you really want to run these jobs. And so you have a static cluster that maybe it's on-premise or maybe it's reserved cloud and resources, and it's a fixed size, and if possible, you want to run the production training job there. But if it doesn't fit, you're willing to pay for on-demand resources uh, to handle that training job because it's that important to you. So you have these two clusters. So we're going to use the available capacity policy we already talked about that will gang schedule uh, these training jobs. So as a proxy for our production training workload, we're going to use the PyTorch image train benchmark. And for each of the Ray clusters we're going to deploy, it will have a CPU head and two GPU workers. Um, we're going to deploy three copies of this Ray job. The first two copies are going to fit on the static cluster, and the third copy is not going to fit there. So we're going to schedule it on the dynamic cluster, and the Luda cluster autoscaler is going to scale up to accommodate it. So this is the placement of those three training jobs. So as you can see, if you're a, a Cuberay user, it's just as easy to deploy these training jobs to the uh, Nova endpoint as it would be to deploy them directly to Cuberay. So it's kind of, because there's a policy engine behind this, it makes things easy from the standpoint of the user. Um, so what we see is the first two training jobs start running right away because they have sufficient resources to run. The third one is waiting for the cluster autoscaler to bring up the additional resources that are needed. It does that, you see that in the middle, and then all three of the jobs can run to completion. And if the Ray job three is deleted, that dynamic uh, scale up can be scaled back down by uh, Luna. So let's look at a second example, but in this example, it's the same training job as the first one, but this time we'll say that they're experimental jobs. So they haven't proven their business value. We don't want to pay for any on-demand resources for these, but we are willing to set up a cluster to run these things in. It's, it's kind of a sunk cost cluster that we're using for experimental jobs. And so in this case, we're not going to use the available capacity policy. We're going to use the specified cluster placement policy to place these jobs. And so here you say, well, hey, if you're going to specify the cluster, why not just run the job directly on the cluster? But the cool thing about this layer of indirection is you could later decide to run these jobs on a different specified cluster, and Nova would take care of doing the rescheduling and for future scheduling. So it's still nice to have the layer of indirection. So we're going to do fill, no spill. So the same, we're going to use the same experimental training workload that we used for the production training workload, and we're going to use the same size Ray cluster. But this time, the three copies of the job will all be placed on the static cluster. And we use the exact same deployment, because it's only the policy engine that makes the outcome differently. So it's, uh, it's, it's super easy to do the same thing. And this time, the two jobs that are running on the static cluster that fit are able to run to completion while the third job is still pending because there's not room on that static cluster for it to run. But if one of those jobs that finishes is deleted, then the additional job that was waiting becomes active and can run. So now let's switch gears and go to uh, serving. And this is an example of serving for production and serving for development. So when we serve for production, we want to create a static cluster that has all the resources that we think maximally we'll need for serving in production. We want a fancier GPU uh, that we've decided is good enough for our um, model in production, and we don't want to do any auto-scaling because we don't want any latency during the production serving. So this is online serving. For development, we're like, oh, you know, latency's fine. These are developers. We're going to scale up when the resources are needed, and we'll scale up a cheaper GPU instance than we're using in production. And so in this case, we're going to use a policy of labeling the clusters. So we'll label the static cluster as the production cluster. We'll label the dynamic cluster as the development cluster. We'll label the placement jobs for serving. And the policy engine will match the labels and put the job on the appropriate cluster. So in this case, we'll run two serving jobs. Um, so the race service that's, that we'll use is the text summarizer model service. So the race service ray cluster will be a CPU head and one GPU worker, and we'll uh, do the deployments as outlined for production and development, and so one will go on each of the two clusters. So we'll deploy the race service uh, in the production namespace. With the, it'll be under the production 
uh, policy, it'll get placed and we'll validate that it serves correctly. We'll do the same thing for the development service. It gets deployed to the development cluster and we validate that it works as well uh, there. So we were able to do uh, these kinds of deployments easily, um, almost as easily as deploying directly to Kubray, and we were able to save costs on the development cluster versus the production cluster. And if we wanted to add more development clusters and more production clusters, we could add them and add a label to them and they would instantly start to be available for workloads. Now let's look at another serving example, but this is for an LLM model. And here we're gonna look at a multi-cloud example. So in this example, we're gonna use yet another policy, and this policy is the priority policy. And you can make a priority on any attribute of a workload cluster, but we're gonna make the priority based on the cloud provider of the workload cluster. So we're gonna use a cluster uh, prediction selection policy that says, schedule this on my preferred higher priority cloud provider you know, workload cluster if possible, otherwise schedule it on my less preferred uh, uh, cloud provider. And we're also going to enable just-in-time um, capability in standby uh, mode, meaning it'll scale to zero when the cluster is idle. And you may be thinking, hey, wait a minute, the cluster's never idle because Kubray's running on it. But, you know, because we've allocated Kubray on every workload um, cluster. But in that sense, Kubray is like a daemon set. It's like a daemon set for the cluster that's there to handle Ray jobs, services, and clusters that are deployed there. In general, it's not needed, and uh, the just-in-time feature has an option that says, for these namespaces, don't let them make me think the cluster is busy. So we'll turn that on for Kubray, so Kubray won't make the cluster look busy. So we're gonna look at two examples here with priority. One is where the priorities are between two, cluster, two uh, uh, cloud providers that I have that are both on-demand resources, and the other one is going to be between two cloud providers where one of them is a spot provider and the other one is uh, a regular cloud provider. So in the first example, both my EKS and GKE clusters are in standby, so they're scaled to zero, so the only thing that's running in the cloud is the control plane, so that's 10 cents an hour. And Kubray isn't keeping those clusters from going to standby, and now I'm going to deploy my first uh, LLM. And when I deploy that, since GKE was my preferred uh, cloud provider, the cluster that is, uh, belongs to GKE will be brought up, my service will start running there, and I'll be able to uh, run the, validate the prediction is running. Now I want to run a second LLM model. I will run it. It will get scheduled on EKS this time because my GKE cluster is full. It will validate, and now both clusters are active. But if I were to delete either of these LLM models, uh, the cluster would get reclaimed. Here's a similar example, but with the Rackspace spot. And if you guys aren't familiar with this, this is a super cheap way to get uh, uh, spot instances of fancy GPUs. But you know, it's, it's a, it doesn't come without risks. They, you may not be able to get the instance you need. So again, I'm going to deploy my LLM, hoping to get the spot instance cluster to, to, to handle it. But if not, I want it to fall back to EKS. So same drill as before uh, with the same outcome. Um, next, we're gonna switch gears. I don't know how many of you have PTSD from a K Kubernetes uh, upgrade uh, uh, experience. Okay, a few of you. <laughs> All right, I know I do, but um, so this is looking at um, using the uh, SkyRay to facilitate Kubernetes upgrade. So we, we ideally want a Kubernetes upgrade that causes no downtime to our AI workloads. And so the idea here is that we're going to have a cluster that's running our workload. We'll label that cluster and our policy will be spread duplicate across all the labeled clusters. So originally I'm only gonna have one cluster with that label. But what I'm gonna do is clone that cluster, this is a feature of um, the fleet manager, and when I clone that cluster, the workload will now run on both of the copies of the cluster. The new one with the new Kubernetes version, the clone will have a higher version, and the original one. And of course my load balancer will still be pointing at the original cluster, I, as the operator, will make sure the new cluster is working fine, and when I'm happy, I'll switch the load balancer over, and I'll take the label off the old cluster, which will then be deleted by the, um, the Nova uh, fleet manager. So this will be, a, instead of the sort of suspend resume uh, version of uh, just-in-time clusters, this is a delete recreate version. 
So here I am labeling the cluster, spread duplicating my workload onto that cluster, deploying the race service for the LLM, and ensuring that it serves. Now I'm going to make a copy of the cluster custom resource that will have in the copy the newer version of Kubernetes and a unique name for the new cluster, and I'm going to deploy it with Nova. The fleet manager will then see that there's a new cluster that matches the label and that it needs to start up the workload there. So it will start up the cluster and then start the workload there. Then, as I said, you can make sure it's, you're happy with the result, and you can then take the label off the old cluster when you are, after you've retargeted your load balancer. Okay, and our final example, we'll bring, in, we'll bring in a little compound AI. Maybe this is the simplest possible compound AI, but this is an LLM plus retrieval augmented generation. So we're gonna have the race service uh, serving the LLM, and we're gonna have another service in front of that race service that will take the user's query, look up a context in a vector database, uh, provide the context and the query to the LLM, get back the result and give it back to the user. And so we're gonna have one cluster that's dedicated to serving. It'll have GPU resources, um, and it will also, just because we wanted to throw this in, it will be running the Cubray autoscaler and the Luna autoscaler. So the Cubray will scale up, and the um, Luna autoscaler will respond by adding more resources to the cluster. Similarly, we have the, comp we have the you know, ingestion cluster that's reading in our data, applying the embeddings, and putting it in the vector database. And in our case, in this example, the ingestion isn't happening all the time. Let's say the ingestion is only happening once a week. So that cluster, which is CPU, let's say, because our ingestion embedding function can run well on CPU, will be cranked up when the ingestion is running and will be uh, put into standby and deleted from the cloud when it's not running. So we'll do the labels and we'll uh, do the policies here. So here we are with the clusters and applying the labels. We're going to deploy our Cubray service, validate that it runs well with the LLM, we're going to run our ingestion job, which will bring our ingestion cluster out of standby and run that job for us and create the vector database. And then we'll crank up our Ray plus LLM serving job on the workload cluster. So now we have the serving cluster with the two serving jobs on it, and the ingestion cluster gets spun down. And so we can see now that the Ray plus LLM query can be answered from the database that we ingested into our vector database. Um, so again, I feel like this shows multi cluster deployment can be almost as simple as single cluster deployment with the right policies in place. So in conclusion, uh, SkyRay seamlessly extends Cubray for multi-cluster, multi-cloud scheduling scenarios. The scenarios we've shown try to accomplish things like reducing launch time, increasing efficiency, managing costs, enhancing robustness, facilitating cluster maintenance, and so on. And we hope that SkyRay can help you with your multi-cluster scenarios with Cubray. And uh, please, you know, use the open source text, uh, you know, scripts and YAMLs. And if you want to try SkyRay in particular with this fleet manager and this cluster autoscaler, of course, it would work with others, uh, there's free versions available for you to give it a try. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Um, otherwise, catch me in the hall. <laughs>